Learn English with text adventure games is today's topic. To be more precise, make a text adventure video for your listeners. Yes. So stick with me until the end here on my phone podcast. You won't regret it. Stick with me until the very end. I'm gonna reveal a very strange method to improve in your target language. This time I'm gonna show you a very unproductive way to learn a language. You got that right. I said an unproductive way. Very, very inefficient indeed. So usually you hear these experts saying something like like become fluent in only one month or maybe three months. Of course, effortless and whatsoever. No, 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 no. By following my advice today, it will take you ages, decades, even a thousand years to become fluent. <laughs> so I wanted to try something new. Yeah, but one thing after the other, right? Slow down, Daniel, slow down. So now I'm gonna show you or explain to you what I meant by this method. So actually, in a nutshell, I tried to make a text adventure game to make a video out of it in which I am reading it out loud in order that you can learn from me, right? And where does the idea come from? Actually, it came from Luke Thompson because he did several text adventures in the past. Visiting the text adventures website, and I'll give you a link in a moment, or by watching the video version of this, because as I said, I'll be sharing my screen, so you'll be able to actually read the same text that I'm reading. So he was basically playing the text adventure and explaining it to us and reading it out loud so that we English learners could improve our English skills, right? So. And at the same time here on this video, he explains how we could use his episode or YouTube video in order to get the most out of it, right? To improve our skills. Number one was just listen to it. Number two was to watch his video and read the text with Luke. And the third tip was to listen to the audio and follow the story on the website. That means that you can play on your own as well, which is really a fantastic way to improve our listening skills or re reading skills. <laughs> the fourth one was listening to the audio and then do the text adventure afterwards. And I decided to do a fifth one. So this is my method. I'm trying to make a video about this text adventure. And at the same time, I also tried to make a Google document with about 20 expressions that I want to learn. And you can do as well. I will put the link on my show notes. And so without any further ado, I will show you <laughs> I will show you the results and I won't comment them. I will just read it out loud and I will make a second video in which I am gonna explain the expressions right there. So, but I absolutely recommend to you that you just listen to the story and you play along with me. And of course you can go to the website and play the game as well. So now, without any further ado, let's head directly to the game. So I think you don't need to, to see my face, so I'm gonna disappear here. And as I said, I won't comment any words or something like that. Um, for that, I will do a second video. Let's get started and have fun. Victorian Detective Interlude, Lost Cases by Peter Carlson. London, 1862. Maudler glanced across the hall of the bustling police station. That wooden chair by the window was still unoccupied. The desk that had once been a second home to his partner. Maudler sighed, for his companion hadn't been back to Scotland Yard for the past two months. It was understandable that the detective would want to take time off. He had lost a dear friend and suffered a terrible gunshot injury. But even so, Maudler thought he would have returned by now. Maudler was feeling reminiscent as he pulled open a desk drawer 
and began rifling through old files. Previous cases that he and his companion had handled, which case should be revisited. Yeah, this is a good question. The break, the unopened safe, the missing Masaccio. Well... I will gonna go with the Wraith. The Wraith. You chased a Wraith, a masked Londoner with three murders to his name, through a moonlit derelict warehouse. Stop! Behind you, you were backed by detectives Mardler, Gennings, Derby, Fleming and Hertzman. The Wraith has a flair for the theatrics, and he's always been a step ahead of Scotland Yard. This is the closest you've been to him, no more than 10 yards away as you sprint through the dark warehouse. The Wraith looks back at you, his mask cold and mysterious, cape billowing in his wake. He leaps up and throws a small firework up at the ceiling, his gadget of choice you've found. There's a loud crack and bright flash above you, and a subtle glint of light at your feet. A couple yards ahead. I duck down and keep running. Failed deduction. You put your head down and keep sprinting, only to find the glint of light on the floor is a tightly stretched trip wire. The wire catches your foot and you topple to ground. That's why the Wraith jumped when he threw the firecracker. Watch the tripwire, you shout as your fellow detectives cautiously step around it. You pull yourself back onto your feet and keep chasing the masked man. He leads you up flights of stairs to the fifth floor, the top floor of the factory. He looks back again and throws a handful of caltrops on the floor. I climb over crates to the left of the caltrops. Failed deduction. You avoid the caltrops by climbing up some crates, running across the creaky wooden lids. Watch the caltrops! You shout as the other detectives maneuver around them. One particularly weak crate gives way to your weight and your foot falls through, cutting your leg. You pull your leg free and continue chasing the wraith. Detective Fleming climbs up on the crates, but he crashes through a weak Ooh. one as well. Keep going, he cries as he climbs out and follows the group. He's cornered himself, yells Mardler. Freeze! The wraith runs into a dead end. An open room with a large window overlooking London at night. Moon and stars overhead, casting glowing light down on the scene. The wraith pulls an orb out of his cape and throws it down at the ground. Bang! Chemical fizz and hiss. And a blinding cloud of white smoke fills the room. The wraith at the center of it. Detectives charge into the smoke, shouting and crashing into each other. I got him! You hear Hertzman shout. Continue. The smoke slowly dissipates after about 30 seconds and you see Hertzman pinning Detective Gannings to the ground. Get off me! 
You oaf, he shouts as he shoves Hertzman away, sending him crashing into Detective Donny. Where the hell did the psychopath go? Look, says Marler, pointing out the open window. Across the road, on the roof of a five-story hospital, you see the wraith crackling menacingly. He pulls his cape up over his pale mask and disappears into the night, coming one with the shadows. How in the bloody hell did he get all the way over there? Spits Scannings as he rushes to the window. That building is a good 40 or 50 feet away. He's not human. And then you pause and think. There are two wraiths. Deduction success. You think that was just a body double, says Mardler. Well, he can't have flown across the gap, you say. Mardler looks down at the street below. Well, then he must have fallen 40 feet, but no one's down there. He never went down. Deduction success. It would have taken too long to climb, and the drop is too short for some type of parachute, you say. The wraith never left. He's hiding somewhere in the warehouse. The seven of you start looking for secret doors and hiding places. Darby calls everyone over after a few minutes of searching. It's his cape and mask, Darby says, pulling out the large dark disguise. He must have stashed it behind his crate after he threw that smoke bomb. And you're most suspicious of Detective Donny. Deduction success. There were six of us chasing the wraith, you say, as you swiftly move across the dark room. Yet, now there are seven. You reach out and grab Detective Donny by the arm. You have faint marks on your face where a mask once tightly rested, you say. I don't remember you being part of the search party of the wraith. What's this in your sleeve? Donny tries to pull away but you grip him tightly and pull a small firecracker out of his sleeve. Saving this for later, Donnie. You should have hidden this with the cape and mask after you threw the smoke bomb. You're under arrest. Continue. Donnie fights back, grabbing your arm and twisting it around. He pulls out his pistol and waves it around menacingly. I never liked you. He laughs into your ear as he fires off around into the ceiling bits of wood and plaster raining down. He yanks you close, using you as a human shield. Nobody move, he barks. I want everyone to put their guns on the floor. I'm in control here. Why are you doing this, Donnie? says Darby. You're the wraith? Just shut up, yells Donnie. Guns on the ground, now! You can leave this warehouse in handcuffs, or you can leave this warehouse in a body bag, says Hertzman. How do you want it? Headbutt, Donnie. Deduction success. Donnie takes the barrel of his pistol of your temple for a moment and you strike. You lurch backward, slamming the back of your head against Donnie's nose, the sound of crunching bone echoing through the hollow warehouse. You spin around quick, grabbing Donnie's arm and twisting his hand until the stunned detective drops his revolver. Wrestling Donnie's to the ground, you go from hostage to capture in a matter of seconds. The other detectives rush over and help pin Donnie down as you stand and take a deep breath. You're going to tell us about the other wraith, Donnie, you say. 